Hey everybody, so today we are going to be talking about what is and isn't the Web3, the Metaverses, and the Omniverse. And for anybody that's interested in graph and especially machine learning, there is a lot to be had in all three of these aspirational ideas that are out there. And yes, they are ideas. Not all of them exist fully as promised. And we're going to definitely get into what are those promises and what out of these technologies already exist and are being used and where do they fall short? We're also going to talk about how they compare to one another because a lot of the time these seem to be interchanged or they're being rebranded as, you know, names of whole companies. Yeah, Meta, I'm talking about you. And we're going to kind of dispel some of that as we go. And ultimately, what are some of the promises that are gonna be the hardest to keep and how us in the data community probably suffer from those same things and what we can learn from all of it. And quite honestly, just like any other kind of technology, it's probably gonna be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and we're all going to adopt it in various forms. So I am starting with Web3 because it is one of the oldest and maybe most often discussed idea in this roster that we're discussing today. And it was very much that, that Tim Berners-Lee uh, multiple hyperlinks connecting everything. All of that came out to be the internet, but what he wasn't really talking about was Google or big Microsoft or any of the other big tech that really is, you know, governing the way that uh, search works today and how the internet is kind of structured. So getting into what is Web3? So Web3 is very focused on two main principles, and we're going to get a little bit more into that, but the main two are decentralization, which means saying I'm going to Google it isn't applicable anymore. And then also using things like blockchain or distributed ledgers, which is what blockchain is. All right, so some of the uh, aspects that tie into those two main tenets. The first is highly connected data, hence graph. So hello world, hello graph. This is a big part of what Web 3.0 is. It's being able to connect data all across different databases, being able to query them all across those databases and not have to go through a mediator, which would be like Google. And a lot of us might think of this as web pages because of Google, but this also would include things like being able to control where your data goes, your personal data, or if you have an asset that is digital, like a document on Google Docs, that you would be able to connect that into all other systems that would be document editors, if that's what you're looking for. Now, a big component to this is users autonomy users being able to own and decide what to do with their data, who has access to it, and be able to even personalize. So like if you go onto YouTube and you have ads, YouTube is selecting which ads are going to make sense for you if you're logged in and it kind of knows your behavior. But what if you could suggest to YouTube what commercials you are interested in or what ads you're, you're actually interested in? That actually would help YouTube a lot because then you know, they're getting what you're actually interested in and they're not having to guess. But the thing is, most companies don't have any mechanism to do this yet. And that's where the personal knowledge graph comes in, which is another big Tim Berners-Lee thing if you want to go and look at solid. My beef with all of that, and that's for another video, is that it's still very developer data person centric, we really need to work on how do we bring that to the masses, people that are not data people. And that is something that I actually proposed as a use case for the uh, Tiger Graph Million uh, Graph Challenge. So if you're interested, go check that out. I'll put a link down below if you're interested. So I already mentioned that this is going away from, you know, those centralized search engines. And the same goes for how you can actually access the internet. You can access it on your desktop or your laptop or your phone, all of these are distributed in a way, but there are still companies and governments that are controlling a lot of those things. So if you're looking at 3.0 as a strict sense, 
it is talking about decentralizing that as well. And most of the time when you hear people talk about 3.0, it's talking about ubiquitous search, and that's really what they mean. Well, let's talk about the metaverse or metaverses. That's a key to this is the metaverses are growing exponentially. <laughs> There's somebody coming out with a metaverse every other day. And I think it's because Meta, aka Facebook, kind of came out, you know, blazing on, on their uh, messaging. But honestly, metaverses have and already do exist. Now, are they to the full promise? Let's find out. Some of the biggest companies in the metaverse, notice I said companies, right? Hence why it's not the same as Web 3.0 because Web 3.0 is like, no, 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 no company should be involved in this, right? There's a big difference. Uh, but some of the big ones are Apple, Microsoft. And when I say Microsoft, I mean their office suite stuff as well as Xbox. And that's gonna be maybe a topic of another video. Now, two main tenets of the metaverse are interoperability so that the data can talk to each other and then portability. So a big thing that you'll hear from people talking about the metaverse is uh, they can pick up their avatar and use it over in, you know, Microsoft, whatever uh, work office uh, equipment that they're using in the metaverse. That's one, that portability and that interoperability goes hand in hand with that. And then a virtual experience. Now, a lot of people will tell you that that only means VR or it means VR and maybe AR, which is augmented uh, reality. I mean, it, it can be anything that's virtual. So if you're uh, somebody that really liked Candy Crush, guess what? That's virtual. So you were in a virtual space playing something. I have friends that they have a bike, a physical bike, and they have a screen that pops up and they can ride their bike through a volcano. Here's a great picture of that. These are other realities that we can just jump into and move around in and do things in. So it's not all video games and it's certainly not all Roblox, which a lot of people also say. All right, so one of the first things that they talk about in those tenants is decentralization. Now, they do not mean the same thing as the Web 3.0 context of decentralization. Really what they're talking about with this is that portability and the interoperability that has to go along with that. So decentralized in, in the metaverse perspective is if you're in the Facebook metaverse, you can uh, take all of your behavior, all of the assets you purchased or um, all of the friends that you have over there and be able to port them over into another metaverse that you might wanna go and explore. So what this means is if you are, uh, maybe purchasing certain assets in the uh, Facebook version of Metaverse, and then you decide to move house, so to speak, and uh, go over to, let's say, the Apple version of the Metaverse, you can actually take your stuff over with you so you don't lose all of it. That's a big part of the decentralization. And that you can access this through any system, or you can go into certain hubs that um, multiple uh, cross-platform. Uh, so that would be if you're working on PC and then uh, for your work, and then you wanna maybe use some of the friends that you've made at work and maybe go and get a card game with them over in the Facebook metaverse, which does not currently exist yet. There's elements of it that are more on probably like the gaming side of things, but most of these metaverses are not talking to each other yet. And metaverse, remember, doesn't also only mean VR. So if you don't have an Oculus Rift or you don't have one of those, those headsets, if it's truly ubiquitous, you should be able to access these things even if you don't have the headgear for it. So there's going to be whole economies behind a lot of these metaverses. And even today, some of the metaverses require you to use just their currency. But at the end of the day, your real currency is buying that digital currency. So kind of think of it that way. We're not quite there yet as far as being able to use your real world money to buy the same currency. Maybe Bitcoin comes close, but there again are different types of Bitcoin out there. Uh, this is so that 
when you were doing that multi-platform, being able to go into one metaverse and then jump into another, that you can use the same currency and the same avatar and not have to like log in again and like do all this strange stuff to to get into uh, that system and access it and then engage with things that are there. So this is where when you hear blockchain and NFTs and other things uh, crop up, it's really focusing on the aspect of the metaverses because they are anticipating that you're going to come in, you're going to want to buy a drink for someone or you're going to want to maybe purchase uh, an in-game avatar outfit or something like that. And if you want to then port over your avatar and your behavior and your friends and whatever else, uh, you will need to be able to probably take along the currency that you have into multiple uh, verses and doesn't really exist yet. So along those same veins are the trust and ethical considerations in the metaverses. So this goes hand in hand with using some of the new technologies that aren't quite either understood or they just don't have a high enough adoption to really test how they're going to break, how they're going to go crazy. Uh, I would say NFTs are probably a good example of how things can go off the rails very fast uh, if you are not careful and ethics, right? So what if you are doing something that is less than ethical who gets to decide those things going back to web 3.0 shouldn't be anybody deciding that if you want to go to a certain website or a certain service or a certain metaverse that caters to the thing that you're interested in even if it doesn't conform to the norms of your society whereas what we have with the metaverse is they are still controlled by companies companies that still have boards of directors, that still have a profit that they have to make. Not saying that things in Web 3.0 won't also make a profit, but because the big companies, it's the magnitude of the metaverses uh, or the companies behind the metaverses right now that are probably going to play a role into what is ethical and what is not. And it's still just such a gray area right now because you don't necessarily want um, you know, super conformity um, and, and block things. But you also want to make sure that these are safe environments. Because remember, a lot of kids, a lot of people that are in, you know, protected groups are, are going to be uh, using these. And we want to make sure that we have the right controls in place to make it a safe environment for them at the very least. Now, there are certainly a lot of other aspects regarding the metaverse, but I have a whole other video that I am preparing for you that will go into more detail. But these are the main things that you need to know about them right now. So that takes us into the Omniverse, which if you do a Google search on Omniverse, the only thing that really shows up for the first few pages is NVIDIA. All right, so the main characteristics of an Omniverse is that it contains everything. And I, it's like, okay, great, thanks, Ashley. That's super helpful. No, hear me out. So the Omniverse is basically talking about all the physical, actual real worlds that we live in. And when I say worlds, I mean like the things you do in your everyday life. So if you go to a physical Starbucks and then you go to a physical Dunkin' the next day, like do those things talk together? So universes almost in your physical world, you can see how you can do a play on that. But ultimately it's the real world plus all the metaverses. And those all will have the same physics and rules that are governing them. And so that goes into some of the things that we just mentioned with the metaverses, but they still have a lot of work to do to get that true, you know, interchange between different verses. So they're still working on that. But when you look at an omniverse, it kind of allows you to look across all of those different worlds. So NVIDIA's Omniverse is really just a big framework to create 3D worlds. So it's a big graphics engine. There's a lot of other plugins from some of the biggest development uh, libraries and tools and services out there for this. So it actually has a lot of interoperability with a lot of other tools. So it's actually getting a little bit closer to what Web 3.0 is, is talking about. But it's also, if this tool, the Omniverse, is going to be used to build out many of the multiverses out there, whether they're AR, VR, or like video game type interfaces, 
then it kind of is an omniverse. It's actually the backbone of a lot of the metaverses that are out there. The other thing is NVIDIA is very well known for their digital twin. And if you don't know what that is, here's my video on it. And some of their other simulations that they can do. There's actually a lot of really powerful things that NVIDIA is doing for physical real world scenarios that are very large scale. And that's something that NVIDIA literally invented. And if you need to do a lot of like processing and things that go outside of just the graphics, if you actually need to have like a lot of um, AI behind the scenes to like, okay, someone did this, what are the ramifications? This is really great in that digital twin aspect because, and, and in the multiverse aspect, because if I jump into a bodily body of water in the real world, physics exists and we know what happens. Making all of those calculations and the main people that are doing that work right now is NVIDIA. If you look across all of the different metaverses that are out there, they're not certainly all using NVIDIA's tools, but a good deal of them are. So in a way, I can see where NVIDIA is coming from from an omniverse perspective. Now, the biggest difference between all of these is that decentralization. Most of the metaverses and even the omniverse are all based out of big companies. To be fair, none of them, the metaverses or the omniverse, has ever claimed to be decentralized, not in the true sense that Web 3.0 describes. Hence why they are not the same, even though some people use them interchangeably, which is understandable because a lot of this is really still up in the air and a lot of it is being discussed on the fly as things are developing. The other two areas that exist, but the sheer uh, adoption and really seeing this at a wide scale that isn't fleshed out enough in any of these is the security and portability. So even with Web 3.0, you know, creating something that is interoperable and yet has total freedom is and has always been a very hard nut to crack. But when we talk about security, you know, the Web 3.0 has a lot of security because you as the user are the impetus. You are the one that has to get it out there and make those decisions, which is why it is so incredibly important for us to make this outside of the data person's brain for it to actually succeed. The other thing is with the metaverse and the omniverse. The omniverse, not so much because it's not about the accessibility uh, from a user's perspective. It's kind of supporting all of uh, you know, the, the other activities in the metaverse is that a lot of the technologies like the NFTs, the blockchain, all of that are still kind of getting fleshed out as well. So until we really understand more about how these are gonna play with security and ethics, I think these are going to be a little tricky and there will be some slippery slopes. While the promise is there, we got to do it in the right way. So all of this is room to grow for sure. All right. So I really hope this has helped you get at least a feel for what all of these are sort of about. I could have whole videos on each of these for sure, but I hope that you've enjoyed this video and I want to thank you very much and I'll catch you next time.